Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is Jeff Kruth from Guildhall. And um, this is the first time that we're uh, trying one of these webinars. And in light of everything that's been happening in the world and the crisis that's going on uh, in the world right now with COVID-19 and, and obviously something that is so dramatically affecting our industry, um, we're looking for new ways that we can communicate and educate and see what we can do um, for the wine community. Uh, and we'll be looking for a number of different ways and programs as, uh, as things evolve um, and ways that we can help. But one of the first things that we um, wanted to do was see if we could create um, some new programs for online learning, uh, and being able to, you know, if, if people to keep people's educations going and uh, and to provide um, you know, interesting content in, in, in the world of wine. Um, and so we um, we spoke with the Court of Master Sommeliers and we're going to initialize this program um, with the court and they're going to take some of their lectures um, that they've developed and, and normally, you know, given a classroom setting. Um, and we're going to see if we can get some of these put up in an online setting. Um, and something that would be free for everybody uh, to use. And um, we'll evolve the different ways that we interact with these. We might create some webinars that are interactive and people can type and, and, and interact. But uh, in order to get something going right away, we wanted to um, record something today and, uh, and get this up on the site as soon as possible. So uh, in starting this off, um, we have Melissa Monosoff. And Melissa is the um, uh, education director for the Court of Master Sommeliers. Is that the correct title? Yes, it is. Yep. Great. So Melissa is the education director for the court. Um, and so she's going to be uh, giving a lecture here on the advanced deductive tasting philosophy for the court. Um, and we'll be um, trying to evolve lots of different types of material in these series, but we thought this was a great place to start out. So um, Melissa, thanks to the court and thank you to you for, uh, for doing this with us. I'm so happy to be doing it. Thank you. Talking about one of my favorite subjects. So the lecture we're going to be talking about today is advanced deductive tasting philosophy and this lecture was created for the advanced course and we wanted to share it with you and even those of you who may be going to the advanced course later this year um, i hope everyone can learn uh, a lot from this lecture and i learn from it every single time i present it or read over it so the impetus for this lecture was to allow advanced sommeliers or people taking the advanced sommelier course to become an advanced sommelier was to take a look at our whole curriculum and look at where people were starting let's say from the introductory course uh, starting off with learning the deductive process understanding even what the deductive process is to the deductive tasting workshop starting to create uh, connections between theory and tasting, calibrating your palate, and also beginning to understand what it is that we're talking about with the idea of cause and effect. So it's kind of where this lecture started and then taking it to the advanced level where you are learning to uh, not only create connections, but really dive in to the idea of cause and effect and really make those theoretical connections. So we break down deductive tasting by kind of knowing where you are now and where you can go with all of this. In this lecture, we're gonna be talking mainly about that idea of cause and effect. And we're gonna be checking off every single, every line on the grid and looking at those, uh, the, the grid um, in a new way, hopefully from a theoretical way and from a very specifically cause and effect sort of way. We also will be looking at how to kind of hone your verbal skills and then also looking at how to take all the important information that you gave during your tasting and finding ways to think through it um, in a very stressful environment usually to come up with a correct conclusion. All right. So why is the first thing we need to talk about why this is an important skill? Okay, so what is the big deal about doing deductive tasting? And I really want to make that distinction between deductive tasting and blind tasting. That is where advanced level tasting begins, where you start to begin to notice that you're not intuitively tasting, you're not guessing, but you're using a more predictable method to come to um, an, a more specific outcome. So we gotta talk about the whys and why I even wanna do this. 
Well, first of all, we need to create that universal language or the rules of the game. So knowing how the rules, um, knowing what the rules are and how to play the game is half of it. Like any test that you probably have ever taken, knowing how to take the test is just as important as the information that you've studied for. So that universal language that I'm talking about is us having a common ground in terms of how we're saying, how we're describing, and the language we're using to describe the wine so that we can um, all be on the same page with that language. And the rules of the game, like what kind of wines are being tested? You know, knowing the types of wines that are being tested, even though this is an ever-changing world, um, provides that backbone for you. And this universal language also creates examinable standards. So we can, we know what you know, we know that you know what you're talking about and have that um, back and forth. So we're able to grade or able to create standards based on that. We also want to talk about important skills is understanding the whys or what the important big rocks are, meaning the big rocks are the important things about the wine that you describe. I mean, that whole grid that we talk about so many different things, but being able to pick out the most important things that you talked about in order to kind of make sense of all of uh, the descriptors that were used in order for you to create a uh, or come to a logical conclusion. Then we talk about the exact the deduction, the art of it, or the idea of using the grid or blind tasting or the act of deduction, not, uh, not guessing, as I mentioned before, or not intuitive tasting where you smell the wine, and you're like, oh, I know what this is, and you create an entire grid based on uh, that idea. But more of that, I mentioned um, that, um, that predictable, note or that predictable idea of the grid of that you're doing it the same way every single time and you're using through method and you're using a method and through that method and the knowledge that you've gained you're able to come to a logical conclusion also emotional stability i know that sounds kind of funny but <laughs> the idea of being present with yourself during your tasting i know we, we might be thinking about a thousand things but being able to remain calm and being able to be with yourself so that you're you are remembering what you're saying and what you're talking about is half the game too that's all part of the rules or the game or the, the rules of the game that you need to find for yourself in order to be successful in a deductive tasting uh, setting so that emotional stability is really important it's really maybe it's about meditation or being in a space where that you can listen to yourself and that's most one of the most important parts Lastly, we talk about your ability to taste, that ability to, uh, to be evaluate and through the practice using the grid. Great, thanks. Right. So um, one of the things, there's a lot of different ways to approach wine yeah. tasting and blind tasting and the CMS method I think is, is, um, is a really, really powerful way to, to do that. And one of the things I've learned the most about in blind tasting was through the, the, the CMS method. Um, I think it's important to realize that it's it's not the only way to taste wine, of course. It's not the only way to blind taste wine. Um, but I think it is one that builds a tremendous number of skills and makes you a really good taster. And so in doing so, you're kind of consciously making the world much smaller. You're limiting the number of grapes and regions where those grapes could be from and, and honing in on very specific things that are more objective and deductive, as you said. Um, so don't think of this as... Um, in my mind, you know, the only way to taste wine or the only way to blind taste wine, but as a really powerful, well thought out way that helps you become a better, uh, better taster, if that makes sense. And, you know, obviously in other programs you see like in the master wine, they, they have very different approaches and they might say, oh, you know, these four wines are coming from the same grape, but they're made in a different style. Write about it. Um, and that's another great exercise, um, of course, but this is a, a really smart, contained method that I think can make you a very uh powerful uh you know blind taster so um great absolutely thank you and i think that segues really nicely into what is the end game of all of this i know we talk often about the exam itself or if you're choosing to to take an exam but really it applies to real life in your job every day as uh jeff was mentioning that it there are so many different methods and finding the method that works for you that 
is applicable to you on the floor as a sommelier in the restaurant or wherever it is that you work. So there, there is or there are the realities of the wine world and on the floor, you can't go to a guest and start reciting the grid about the wine, but you can apply this methodology for improving sales or improving your ability to describe a wine. And when you're able to describe a wine and you're able to apply your theory knowledge and your tasting knowledge uh, to selling wine on the floor, that's where the magic is. That's really the whole point of all of this um, or in the idea of the exam versus real life. Um, also, I realized as I was going through the program and as I was studying, I became a better sommelier as my theory knowledge improved, as my tasting ability improved, I realized I was better on the floor and I was better to my guests for that. And I think that all of this together, we can't think of the idea of the theory exam, the tasting exam and the service or practical exam being in silos. They really all affect each other and really are important for becoming a better sommelier in the end. And likewise, using um, this blind tasting method for evaluating for value and also for um, service and hospitality. All of those, those two points are within the things I just mentioned, that as you become a better taster, you're able to evaluate better for quality when you are um, evaluating for selection on your wine list and that sea of $25 sans serres in the world, how are you able to pick out um, the one that's right for your program or evaluate the wine for, for value or which is the best of the bunch. Which producers kind of stand outside the normal realm of, of let's say Chablis or Sancerre. Knowing producer knowledge or understanding producer knowledge is also really key and important here. And all of this applies to the idea of service and hospitality, giving great service to your guests and being able to describe the wine and understanding the wine world in a different way. So what are the next steps here? The hows and whys of cause and effect. After that kind of lengthy preamble, let's get into the meat of it and how we are gonna go about this. The whole idea here is looking at the hows and whys or cause and effect. So what happened or what is the thing that you see in the glass and how did that happen? What caused it? So this goes um, through grape variety knowledge, viticulture, vinification, wine law, and um, typical styles or archetypal st styles. This is all theory knowledge, understanding grape varieties, understanding viticulture, understanding how wines the world are produced, understanding wine law, and having that experience of certain types of producers or a, a broad depth of producers is really all about theory knowledge. And here in this lecture, we are gonna go through pretty much every single line of the grid, and it may feel a little tedious at times, but when you see how in depth you can look at you know, theory knowledge with every single line on the grid and how it applies to that line, that it will bring a whole new light to how you're approaching the grid and how you're approaching uh, the blind or uh, deductive tasting evaluation in itself. All right, so here's our grid. <laughs> this is the Court of Master Sommelier's grid, um, our deductive tasting grid. All right, and as you know, we have these lovely uh, parts of the grid. Of course, the site, what the wine looks like, the nose, what the wine smells like, the palate, what the wine tastes like, and we divide them into the palate structure and all the palate itself and then the palate structure and then initial and then final conclusion. All right, so for site, as I mentioned, we are gonna be looking at every single line of the grid and looking at the, at the effect, what we see, and then what caused that effect. I'm sure many of you can think of some other ideas as to what caused the thing that we're talking about, but we'll mention a few here and I look forward to your comments later about some other things too. So the first line of the grid, we have the clarity versus sediment. And the first line, we talk about the effect. So the thing that we say uh, when we are talking, uh, when we're evaluating the wine is clear, hazy, or turbid. 
So when we see a clear wine, what happened? When we see a hazy wine, what caused that? Or a turbid wine, <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully we don't see too many of those, but we might. Um, in the beer world, we talk about that all the time. But here, the cause of these three levels is finding infiltration, how and why or how much stabilization, cold stabilization. For red wines, we could talk about pigment or loss of pigment or pigment in solution and age. We can also be talking about faults if it's completely very, very hazy and uh, sediment in the bottle. So those are the things we are talking about. So when we see a wine like this, we need to understand what happened. What kind of winemaking happened that caused this wine to be so clear and so bright? What happened if it became, if it was a little bit more hazy or more um, on the, with, with pigments or um, sediment in the glass? What happened? We're kind of diving into each line and why the thing happened in the glass. Here's a picture I took on my my kitchen counter a while ago when the when the hazy IPAs were starting to come out because sometimes in wine we don't see it very often but in beer we completely see it we see the uh, the German style of a, a German lager that is just very very clear and bright and then a very very hazy IPA with all of that all those particles hanging out in suspension in the beer um, I don't know I just like that picture I always like talking about beer so there we go <laughs> the next line yeah sorry Jeff for you with that that picture back there that that you were describing as hazy if you saw a wine like that <laughs> exactly turbid right i do you see very many wines that are turbid well, like that if you if you saw a wine that because we just so people understand this term clear and hazy and turbid yeah. if you saw a wine that looked like what that beer on the uh, on the screen looked like a second ago would you use the word hazy to describe that or would you use the word turbid to describe that Yes, turbid would be the descriptor there. And um, I mean, you can go back to the picture there. Uh, yes, in the beer world, turbid is the word that is used. And it is a name for a beer with a lot of particles in suspension. Absolutely. Great. So the next line we talk about is uh, color intensity of white wine. So I think this is a um, an often skipped a uh, line or an often skipped important thing to mention, not only for whites, but for reds. So when we talk about the intensity, we use the words pale, medium, and deep, but what does that mean? What does it refer to? I mean, of course, we're talking about the intensity of color um, of the wine, but what happened to cause that intensity of color? We need to ask ourselves some questions. First of all, if it's very, very pale, what happened that caused that to be pale? Or if it's medium, it's like choosing C on the on the test. But then if it's deep, these it's really important to note what happened to the wine and kind of explore those options. Usually we're talking about oxidation with the wine that could happen through the use of oak. Um, other vin vinification techniques could cause that as well. Um, and age, especially for white wines. If the white wine is uh, in uh, deeper in color, we need to ask ourselves what happened and what caused that oxidation of that color. Ah, oh, yes, I forgot my little line there about botrytis. So for white wines, yeah, so what happened in the oxidation? It's gonna be oak, age, botrytis, and a few other vinification techniques. The color intensity for red wines is also really, really important. If the wine is super pale, super deep, that really tells you something about the wine and you really need to explore what happened. So this intensity of color or the phenol, um, the, uh, the, the color phenolics, meaning what, uh, what caused that wine to have that intensity of color. This could be in winemaking in terms of um, you know, cold soaking and so many other um, vinification techniques like maceration, I mentioned cold soak, a few things can cause that intensity of deep, rich, intense color. But on the other side, what caused the wine to be super pale? If a wine, a grape or a wine is very, very pale in color, you can read straight through it. What happened? What kind of grapes make wine like that? And being able to classify 
or take wines um, that are, let's say, um, important wines of the world and being able to put them into certain boxes or into certain camps, as people say, or what playground do they play in is really important to be able to kind of narrow that world down for yourself and know how the wines of the world play typically um, with color and color intensity. As I mentioned before, I think this is an often missed uh, section or part of the grid. And I think it is really important because it helps you narrow down the wine world very quickly and helps your brain kind of focus on what grape varieties and what wines you should be focusing on later down the field when you're coming to your conclusion. All right, there we go. So when we talk about the, that was the color intensity, but now we actually have to talk about the actual color. I like talking about the intensity a lot because I think it tells you a little bit more about um, what type of grape variety it is being made from. But the colors for the white wine, we're looking at something like water white, straw, yellow, or gold. And a lot of these have to do with kind of lighting sometimes, uh, what the room is presenting. Of course, we always want to try and taste wine um, over a white background with very clean glasses. But that isn't always the case, and certain colors show up based on whether there are drapes in the room or um, the lighting, as I mentioned. But what causes the actual color of the wine can be because of the natural grape skin pigments, the actual the age of the wine, how much oxidation has happened. We mentioned botrytis before, and also winemaking, maceration of the skins with the, the, the juice, oxidation happening from oak, and other methods too. I have a question here, Melissa. You have, um, especially if you look at these top three glasses, that looks to me like a good example of straw and yellow and gold across the top. Oh, yes. When you get on the bottom, um, you know, and you have these things like amber, tawny, kind of browner colors. Um, do you are there any specific terms um, that you would call those three on the bottom? Yeah, I know um, in our grids, we don't have the, the, the this current grid does not have uh, those colors in them. But I think, you know, learning to describe them uh, for like wines, uh, whether they be sweet wines, Madeira, or even some sherries as well. But I think the, the words that you use were very, very good descriptors to use. But I think that's important for us to, to look at that, to be able to create grids for ourselves, for other types of wines that are outside the realm of this grid itself, whether it be for, for uh, fortified wines and also for um, sweet wines as well. So that, yeah. on that top row, would you agree that those kind of a good example of sort of straw, yellow and gold in sequence, in sequence and then also you can use your, your adjective that you had in the previous slide. So this could be like a pale gold or a deep gold. So you can kind of combine um, the previous slide as an adjective to describe then the color that you're selecting here. Does that make, is that, would you agree with that? Correct. Yeah, so th these are where um, you kind of get that combo effect of uh, and getting into the rhythm of talking about pale, medium, or deep is a wine, uh, water, water white, straw, yellow, or gold. So yes, you get the combination of um, the medium gold or medium straw, exactly, or a pale straw. Water white is for wines that really have very, very little color. There aren't that many in the wine world, but when you see it, that you know that it has just very, very little color. Sometimes I see that it was very young New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs or some other wines, um, very, very young white wines. Does that make sense? Great. Cool. Thank you. So we need to pair that also with secondary hues. So there's actually kind of a three-pronged approach. So there's the, the intensity of the color, what the color is itself, and is if, if there are any secondary hues. So for instance, we can use words like silver, green, copper, and gold. And what caused those things to happen? So it could be the climate caused it, color pigment in uh, the actual grape variety, the length of maceration, and other winemaking techniques. So what I mean by this is what causes a uh, secondary hue? Could it be because of a cool climate? Could it be a color pigment um, within the grape variety? So for instance, grape varieties that have natural red or pink pigments like uh, Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio or Gewürztraminer and a few other grape varieties provide a little extra hue 
maybe in a brassy note um, or a copper tone that would um, be indicative of that grape variety in the wine and show up in the wine. Also length of maceration. Winemakers can choose if they want that color to be there or not. So I think if we remember a few years back when uh, Pinot Grigio Romato went through a, <laughs> a phase or, you know, Rosé Pinot Grigio went through a phase, um, that was uh, a winemaking choice. So they have the choice um, on how they want to make the wine uh, with, re with that regard. All right. So for red wines, the colors we're speaking of would be purple, ruby, red, and garnet, and all the different variations of them on the screen. So what caused them to happen, or what caused those uh, colors to occur? Now, of course, it could be the natural grape skin pigment, so the amount of anthocyanins that those grape varieties have naturally. Some have more, some have less. It could become a be because of climate, let's say elevation for a Malbec perhaps. Vinification techniques, what the winemaker chose, how much they chose to um, either uh, macerate the grapes, keep the grapes um, in contact with the skin, and also oxidation in terms of oak aging and actual age of the wine itself. So remembering that the color of a red wine can be from many different uh, many different things like for instance say nebbiolo has a very garnet color is that from age when you see this wine or is it from the natural uh, pigment of the grape in that case it's from the natural pigment of the grape but on first inspection it may look like a wine that has been aged for a significant amount of time so remembering to keep your options open and keeping your mind open to diving into what happened to this wine and why I think one um, one tip with uh, with those colors there that um, it, I think in general single variety wines tend to be more more or less consistent um, in the sense that you know there's obviously going to be difference between Pinot Noirs they're going to have very different colors but they mm -hmm. tend to be fairly compact range um, where blends you can often see a lot more variation within color so if you take a wine like Zinfandel which may often be blended the difference between one Zinfandel in color which has 100% Zinfandel and one that has, you know, 20%, uh, you know, Alicante Boucher or, or Petit Syrah or something, you can have a big shift in colors between different wines that are blends even more so than, you know, with a single variety wine. I think at an advanced level, that's something that, that can be interesting to keep in mind. And I think that's a, a great point because we talk about putting uh, varieties into camps or keeping your red wine grape varieties like I mentioned with white wine um, into ideas okay here are my um, you know light like light colored or um, pale colored red wines here are my purple here are my ruby here are my red here are my garnets and how they play amongst each other um, in terms of intensity and also color but then there's the idea that you mentioned uh, most people don't know that Zinfandel on its own can be, you know, a medium red or garnet color. But in the real world of winemaking, it is blended with uh, Alicante Boucher or Petit Syrah most often. And, or we can talk about the idea of a, a Beaujolais Village versus uh, a modern crew. Those colors are very, very different based on quality level and understanding that and that part of the wine world is important for moving on to your advanced level or master level tasting. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, that was a great point. So that other point in secondary colors for red wines, the, the hues that we might see are that third prong um, of the color evaluation in terms of orange, blue, ruby, garnet, and brown, how those colors play and what happened to cause them. So it could obviously be because of the grape variety itself, the age, whether it's young or old and has seen oxidation, vinification techniques, what happened in the winery to cause that, and even altitude, like I mentioned earlier about, about that Malbec. And vinification can be multi-pronged as well. As Jeff was mentioning, what happened in the winery? I know we've all seen many Pinot Noirs that are very pale um, in color, and then we've seen Pinot Noirs that are very deep and rich in color and almost purple. What happened there? <laughs> A lot of things can happen. But the, the effect or the words that we use for describing secondary colors 
orange, blue, ruby, garnet, and brown are um, great indicators of, um, as I mentioned, age and a great way to look for uh, unique aspects about uh, each wine. As I mentioned, uh, that three-pronged approach of the pale color or the intensity of color and then on to the color itself and then on to the hue of the wine, that is the three-pronged approach of the color scheme or color noting that I was mentioning. And be able to get into a rhythm of noting all three of those in a very you know quick manner, but also a very uh, an evaluative manner that means something to you that can give you clues for later down the road. The next line we talk about is rim variation. And rim variation can be tricky. And remember, we only talk about this with red wines. I know this is noted on the grid um, for, uh, for both, but really we are just looking at red wines mostly. The effect is whether it's yes or no. No rim variation or yes, there is rim variation. And what caused it if you see it? If you see it, it could because be because of the grape variety itself, oxidation happening or aging, a youthful wine versus an aged wine, fermentation techniques that the winemaking, the winemaker has chosen to use. And here, what we're looking for is whether you're seeing rim variation and how do you see it? What are you looking for? In a very youthful wine, a lot of times I'll just say that the color is clear or the same, um, a ruby uh, from core to rim with a pink youthful pink rim. And for me, whether there is no rim variation aside from that little pink rim on the wine, but it reminds me that I'm looking at a wine that is very youthful and uh, very pink and ruby in color. But when you start to see those gradations of color, the gradations of uh, a, a garnet wine in the center, it becomes a lighter garnet and then maybe an orange and then maybe a brown on the top. You're talking about rings of color over time and uh, over time of aging and what that could possibly mean um, as well to the wine. So you are talking about an aged wine if you are starting to see uh, those gradations of color throughout. Next line we're talking about is extract and staining. Again, we're using this for red wines only because red wines have the pigments in order to do this. The effect is none, light, medium, or heavy staining. And noting staining is really important because it tells you a lot about the wine, the winemaking techniques, and uh, what grape varieties could possibly do this. So again, the cause of staining altogether is the intensity of color pigments in the, in the grape variety itself or in the winemaking technique. Um, the vinification techniques, and then also dry extract in the wine. So how much uh, how much stuff is in the wine that can cause uh, some uh, left color on the glass? A staining can be found in a couple of different ways. It can be found in the tears, like this picture here, that you can see the color actually in the tears, and that is a lot of color if you see that. But sometimes it's really notable if you tilt the glass away from you and you turn the glass slowly, you can see the color dragging across the bottom of the glass. And there are so many wines that I've seen that in and surprising wines too. I see that in Beaujolais uh, Village and carbonic maceration. I can see color dragging across uh, the bottom of the glass and other wines that um, have that intensity of color and pigmentation in the wine itself. Next is tearing. So that tearing that you see, light, medium, or heavy tearing, um, you're looking for uh, the actual tearing on the glass, but remembering that, the, uh, that every glass is different, whether the glass was polished well or not, and what kind of rag, what kind of detergent was used uh, when cleaning the glass. But something I think that is very important is not waiting too long for it. I, a lot of students uh, or even myself, you're just like waiting and waiting to see the tears happening. And sometimes they don't for a while. So noting that you, you see something or not and come back to it when you do see something. Uh, it is important to keep moving on the grid to keep moving through your tasting and not waiting too long for those tears to happen. So if you see something, say something. And if it doesn't come around right away, wait for it and you'll see it later. 
So the cause, what happened here? So we can go into the whole Marangoni effect. I know that's really very sciencey, but there actually is a name for what happened, this, this phenomenon on the glass, but really just not getting hung up on it and uh, remembering just to keep moving and knowing that the reason for these tasting or these tear tears are for the fact that um, this reaction you know, a, a surface tension reaction between the air, um, the alcohol in the wine, and uh, the extract in the glass itself. And it is important to notice if it is light, medium, or heavy, because well, if we have a light tearing wine, that could be a lighter alcohol wine, it could be um, from a cooler climate, from a medium or heavy tearing wine, we could be looking possibly at a wine that has uh, residual sugar from a warmer climate, higher alcohol, and all important things to look for um, in the site of the wine. I, I like your note here to not get hung up on this because um, I think it can be really important and you absolutely should look at it, but since this effect, it's caused by the difference in the evaporation rate of alcohol and of water, um, and that's uh, chemically what, what causes this, um, and that's affected by temperature as well, uh, expected by the glass, and so you could have different glasses, the wine slightly different temperature, you might find that this um, appears differently on any given day, any given glass with the wine, um, and I'm not saying it's not important, it's definitely something to look at, but don't be surprised if in one glass um, you might see it appear a little differently than it would in a different glass. Definitely, I see this when we're doing tasting workshops or tasting with people, I can point to a glass for, of a person three seats away and say, okay, everyone look at their glass. And meanwhile, my glass is not doing that thing <laughs> at all. So for sure. Okay. So last slide, finally, I know there's so many things to go through in the site. You're supposed to go through it in 15 seconds, but so many things to, to look for and evaluate. One of the last things is gas evidence. If you see any gas, really just noting if it is light, medium, or heavy. I mean, heavy would be in terms of looking at sparkling wine. But if you see gas at all in the wine, what happened? You know, sometimes it could be a flaw. Sometimes it could be something about a wine uh, bottled soon after fermentation. Screw cap closures can cause that. Carbonic maceration maybe, surly aging and CO2 added um, as a preservative. So all of these things can cause a little bit of bubbles in the glass and important to know because it could be from one of these uh, things happening in winemaking. There you go, finally onto the nose. Tim Gazer is gonna be helping us out with this one. <laughs> All right, the um, nose. So what are we talking about here in terms of processing aroma? The nose or the smell of the wine? At an advanced level, we'll start to think about our direct processing of aroma or nosing the wine. And then also thinking about retronasal olfaction. So the idea of the, the aromas that and the flavors that are produced in the back of the, the nose and throat, that connection between the nasal cavity and your palate, creating that retronasal effect or that retronasal flavor um, that can be very important. Some people are retronasal tasters. They, they find that they get more information that way. Um, I think I'm a little bit of, I think everyone's individual um, or everyone has individual preferences or individual um, abilities in that way. But it's important to explore both of them to see how your palate processes aroma and flavor and being able to use that to um, your advantage. So the idea of swirling, um, why we swirl the glass, sometimes you want to swirl the glass, sometimes you don't. The idea of swirling is really to bring aromas out of the glass to your nose to be able to, to evaluate those aromas. Sometimes I see people swirling a little too much or smelling a little too much. Remembering that your, your nasal or your uh, nasal cavity or ability to smell actually decreases over time. The more you smell something, the more it becomes uh, less, let's say. Um, let's say you, you walk into the room and a guy or a gal is wearing entirely too much cologne or perfume and you notice it and you get really upset about it or mad, like, I can't believe that person is wearing so much perfume. And then a couple of minutes later, you don't smell it at all until you leave the room and then you come back 
And then all of a sudden you're like, there they are, I smell it again. Your, your nasal factor, uh, your ability to smell that was decreased or diminished and over time. And the more you smell a wine could have the same effect. So when I see people, and I've tried to keep this calm myself, is when I swirl and smell, to smirl, swirl and smell once and put the glass down and then think about it and then come back to it. The more you keep putting your nose into the glass, the more you desensitize your ability to smell. So take just a few snips and keep your, keep your nose and your olfactory senses um, awake in the ability to smell the finite differences between the wines. A couple um, points I might make on the nose here because it's such an important factor in blind tasting. Um, one is that if you're kind of newer at this um, uh, in blind tasting, um, one thing to know is that as you taste and smell a lot of wines, you're going to build new neural pathways in your brain. And there's going to be things that you may find that you don't smell as easily. And then after a lot of practice and years and years even, you're constantly developing these new neural pathways and you'll actually smell things over time um, that you might not have smelled. And, and I'll now as doing this for so many years, I'll pick up on smells that years ago I, I might not have. Um, and, and so you're expanding kind of your perception uh, as you're kind of training your brain to smell. Um, and the second thing that I remember, especially, and this is really important in blind tasting, is that you can easily trick yourself into smelling something that's not there. And the way your brain works is we take in various inputs and our brain synthesizes this into what we perceive as reality. And there's a, um, you can Google this and find this um, with audio and visual, uh, this example where, you know, scientists have a, a thing where you'll see somebody's lips and you hear a sound like ba or fa. And you'll actually hear it or see it differently if you're watching and seeing the ba versus fa. And you can hear the recording and you'll swear the recording changes, but what's changing is your lips and, and then your brain is synthesizing that and creating a sense of reality. And so when you think you're going to smell something, you know, if you see the bottle says Sancerre on it or somebody says, oh, don't you smell the whatever, apple, um, you have to be careful in blind tasting because, you know, people tend to get on something, oh, I think I know what this is. And as soon as they think they know what something is, there's a tendency to actually smell things really smell things that may not even be in the wine. So you always have to be careful, try to be as objective as possible and not expect certain smells. Um, and I think that can help a lot in this. I actually did that the other day <laughs> and it happens a lot. I opened up, a, I grabbed a bottle from a refrigerator and I thought it was Alperino. I thought I grabbed an Alperino and I opened it and I poured it and I told him like, yeah, this is really terpenic. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I really get the flowers here. And then I'm like, wait, no, I don't. And I looked at the bottle and it was Pinot Grigio. <laughs> and I was like, oops. Yeah, I totally talked myself in for a half a second there, like, oh yeah, this is this, this, and this. And then it wasn't completely at all until I until I was like, wait a minute, it kind of isn't. Shoot, am I losing my touch or what's going on? And then I looked at the bottle and it was not even Alvarino. But that idea of improving your memory and recall is just exactly as, as Jeff was saying, the idea of practicing smelling, being that crazy lady in the Whole Foods like I was when I was studying, um, practicing smelling things is I didn't know the difference between um, you know, a tangerine and an orange or grapefruit. I couldn't really describe tar. I'm like, how do I describe tar? I don't even really know. Um, until my street was being paved um, in Philadelphia with uh, was being repaved. And I just like stood behind that truck and just smelled tar for like a couple minutes. Cause when do I ever smell tar really? Um, and also I, I have an issue with smelling and tasting uh, white pepper um, in wine. In food, I'm a cook. I can smell white pepper or pick out white pepper and black pepper, no problem in food, but in wine, it's not there for me at all. So I can't get hung up on certain aromas and flavors because everyone is different. Okay, so um, next is clean or faulty. Uh, what is the, is the wine clean or faulty? Meaning that uh, is there an objective or subjective problem with the wine? And here we're looking for an objective point of view, not whether if you like the wine or don't like the wine, more of is there an actual problem with the wine from a, um, an objective point of view. We look at this through the idea of uh, TCA, corked wine, sulfur compounds, VA, EA, Britannomyces, 
oxidation, matterization, and there are a whole host of others as well. And here, some of these can be considered false, and other of these can be considered very much part of the wine and a very distinctive part of specific wines. TCA, I think we all can all agree on, or is very much a fault. Sulfur compounds, we could be talking about any number um, of sulfur, di excess sulfur dioxide um, and other sulfur reductive um, compounds. And then VA, EA, for tannomyces, or especially let's talk about VA and EA, can be very much a part of great wines like Barolo, Barbaresco, Brunello. Uh, we can be talking about that with some Bordeaux too. For tannomyces, again, when appropriate, it's a very distinctive and often delicious, depending on the person, uh, part of a wine. We could be talking about wines from Burgundy, from Bordeaux, Chateauneuf de Pop, and many others. Oxidation and matterization can be considered a fault, depending on how it happened. Oxidation happening because of things that we mentioned before in winemaking or from uh, from botrytis or other things. And then matterization, the actual cooking of the wine. In Madeira, we like this, but in other wines, other um, may be considered a fault as well. Yeah, I think this is something where there's there's a, a little bit of a fine line um, here of, of what's a fault, um, and, and what is a feature. Um, and I think it can be helpful just to think in terms of what do you think most, as you learn these things, um, what do you think most wine professionals, people who understand wine, um, who know what's going on, what do you think how most of them would feel is this um, something that's a level of a fault? So obviously, like you said, some wines you expect a little bit of volatile acidity um, and they can be at some levels pleasant, and we're all gonna have our own opinion as to what level is pleasant, and what level is fault. Um, but I think it's good to have a sense of, okay, in general, once you have a certain amount of one of these characters where most people in the wine business would say, yeah, that's, um, you know, whether you like it or not, okay, great, that's fine, you know, drink whatever you like, but, but most professionals would say that's probably reached a level where it's a fault in that style of wine. Absolutely. And when you're moving into advanced and master level uh, tasting, this is where you dive into each line and learn about the causes and effects of each line. So actually this year at the advanced course, we're going to be doing a false lecture where we will be doing this. When we'll be diving into like what happens that causes TCA and what is it that we find in the wine that, that, um, that leads us to know it's TCA or certain sulfur compounds like sulfur dioxide. What is it that we smell like burnt match or wet wool or metallic or bitter flavors that can lead us or let us know that they're, that the SO or H2S, hydrogen sulfide, when you smell more of the sweaty onions or hard boiled eggs, I mean, it doesn't really sound <laughs> very, very delicious. But then, you know, thiols or mercaptans or reduction in wine, what does this all mean? And diving into the theory of all of that helps you understand winemaking and helps you understand what type of wines will show those type of things, types of things. And then when you find them in the wine, it may help you evaluate the wine in a different way and be able to come to a, a, a more accurate conclusion. Like with Britannomyces, what are the things that you find that lead you to Britannomyces? Maybe it's like, I have like the horse blanket. What does horse blanket even smell like? I don't know. <laughs> but I like that picture with the pink horse blanket. No, it's like, like leather or, or Band-Aid um, and, um, and maybe even barnyard and things like that. What do those smell like in certain wines? Because for me, they smell different in Bordeaux. It smells different in Burgundy. And it smells different in Chateau de Pop. So all of those different smells um, are important to a conclusion and understanding what they mean to you and how you can describe them to better understand the wine itself. I mean, we can find Britannomyces in Chinon and, and, in, and in Beaujolais Cru too. So all of those have the potential, but where does the Britannomyces come from? How does it get there? And understanding that from a theoretical perspective will help you understand the wine in the end. When we talk about VA and, and EA, you know, we're talking about volatile acidity, acetic, um, uh, acetobacter or acetic acid. And what happens? What happened? Why did the wine, why does the wine have that? You know, a lot of times because of alcohol or the production or elevated alcohols and the um, acid producing yeasts in the environment. Jeff, I don't know if you have more that you want to comment in that direction. I would make one small correction here. Yeah. Just um, 
which is that Britannomyces in a way here is actually the cause and not the effect, and that the phenols that the Britannomyces are creating, so Britannomyces being a strain of yeast, um, and that the effect is actually uh, specific phenols that are created by the Britannomyces. Thank you. No, I appreciate you saying it like that. That definitely is a better way to, to, to say that for sure. And, and like we said before, sometimes it's an objective, um, we're looking for an objective point of view. Uh, subjectively, some people like Britannomyces in their wine and some people don't. And so uh, noting that you're looking at this from that point of view is an important uh, distinction. Thank you. Great. Next, we need to look at the intensity of flavor. So the intensity or the or aromas, excuse me, are the intensity is the intensity delicate, moderate, or very powerful. And what caused this? It could be because of alcohol. It could be about impact compounds, which we'll talk about shortly, and other sort of telling aromas or aromas that are very specific um, to specific wines. Have you ever had a guest ask for a wine that goes to 11? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want an 11, only 11. <laughs> no, I've had like more. I want like a 7.5 tonight. <laughs> I usually do 11, but <laughs> here are the impact compounds that are most notable that we we're talking about are these powerful aromas that we get from the wine. And um, the impact compounds we want to talk about are monoterpenes or terpenes, rotundone. TDN, thiols, and pyrazines. Now these words are not words you ever want to use with a guest <laughs> and are kind of science-y, but they are very important to very specific wines. When we talk about monoterpenes, we're talking about usually a very floral character, rotundone, pepper, white pepper, black pepper, often things that I can't uh, smell or taste in wine. TDN, that idea of petrol, thiols, um, that uh, idea of um, uh, some of the, and well, beer I can describe on thiols a little bit better in beer, but they can be, there's actually a wide range of thiol aromas, which we'll talk about in a second, and pyrazines being more that bell pepper, um, uh, peppery, green, jalapeno pepper, grass, things like that, um, that are important to certain wines. Jeff, did you want to say anything about uh, thiols or, I mean, or yes. any of them? Maybe there's a wide range of, of aromas and flavors for thiols is, Intense. Yeah, I mean the, the, that can go everything from the grapefruit in your Sauvignon Blanc all the way to kind of you know those rotten eggs. So the, some of these are are really complicated. Complicated. We could do an entire yes. webinar series just on this screen. Um, but one resource I might point people to is if you're learning more is um, our expert guide to tasting in the expert section on on, on the Guildsom site. Um, defines each of these and goes into a little bit more detail. So um, it's something that I, I think on everybody's own time, um, it's something that can, you know, it can be really helpful to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Obviously, like Melissa said, you know, these aren't, these are kind of like medical terms, right? They're terms to understand, um, not terms to use with guests, um, but we provide some, some, some resources that you can kind of dig in and learn more about these. On the previous slide, I had mentioned um, some things about the you know, powerful aromas being um, alcohol driven. I mean, some people may find that alcohol creates more powerful um, aromas. And then the idea of um, the impact compounds, which we just talked about, and then other telling aromatics that can happen uh, through winemaking. And I think that's going to be an important part that we'll be talking about in a second, too, um, is some of the other telling aromas or winemaking techniques that may happen in wine that can give you a clue as to what happened uh, with the wine or how the wine was made. All right, so the next we have the age assessment. And the thing that we say, well, we'll, we'll talk about youthful, um, developing, and um, age. Youthful aromas, you know, usually are caused um, by strong aromatic compounds, very primary fresh fruit, fresh ripe fruit character, um, often can do uh, well with winemaking. And, uh, and then we can move into the age assessment looking at developing, which is slightly different. There, we're looking at things like oxidation of aromatic compounds, a little bit less fresh, a little bit more on the bruised side, a little bit more on the dried side, um, secondary notes for sure. 
and then um, integration, more integration of flavors. Sometimes with the youthful wines, we see you know a fruit and um, an, an earthy component, or maybe other fruit notes that are all kind of disparate. But then once uh, the wine starts to develop, those things sort of meld together and become um, more integrated. And also we can talk about structural changes as well. Age assessment, we'll be talking about um, Venice with a, um, the third prong of the age assessment, where we find more kind of mushroomy flavors, um, more oxidation, like nutty and dried fruit characters, tertiary notes, and integration, even more melding um, in integration of aromas and flavors. With white wines, fruit character that we are looking to describe as citrus, apple pear, stone or pit fruit, tropical or melon, and those are the big broad categories. When you want to dive in and get more specific is where you're taking your tasting to more of an advanced level. Are we talking about red apple? Are we talking about yellow or green apple? Are we talking about what kind of pear are we talking about, a brown pear or a green pear? What's the, what is that difference between grapefruit, tangerines, oranges, lemons, and limes? They're all very different and describe very specific wines. When we talk about peach and apricots and all the different tropical fruits and melons um, like honeydew or cantaloupe. If anybody ever sees or hears the term pomaceous for apple pear, just um, people, if you find that confusing, sometimes people will refer to that kind of apple pear category as pomaceous, so citrus, pomaceous, stone fruit, tropical fruit, that's kind of basic categories for whites. Absolutely, and, and noting that starting from that larger category is a great way to go. And when you say um, I'm smelling some primarily pomaceous fruits, start there, and then dive into what type of pomaceous fruits. Or if you're like, I'm getting mainly citrus, organize your brain. And the type of citrus I'm getting is lime or lemon, or whether it be a Meyer lemon or something more of a, um, a sweet fruit, like a sweet citrus, like tangerine. So organizing your brain in that way is really helpful. Thankfully, we only have uh, three categories of uh, red wine fruits. So the reds, the blacks, and the blues. And again, I get mainly red fruit in this wine. I get mainly red cherries. Think about all the red fruits you know, whether it be strawberries and raspberries and pomegranates. And then we can dive in um, further as to what type of fruits they are within that category. So you've got your red fruits, but what are your sweet red fruits? Or what are your more sour or tart red fruits? And if you're describing more tart red fruits like cranberries and um, raspberries and maybe um, pomegranates, you that really helps organize your brain and think about what type of wines present those type of fruits. Because it's very different for a wine that has a lot of cherry flavor, um, a lot of red cherries and sour red cherries versus those that really show up as being more of that kind of raspberry and uh, cranberry aromas and flavors. And same for black fruits. We'll be talking about black currants, black berries, boysenberries, um, and um, there's only very few of those, and then blueberries um, for blue. One of the most important categories I find is uh, the fruit character, is how does the fruit show up in the wine? Is the fruit fresh, stewed, candied, dried? This really is very indicative of very specific types of wines. And yes, there are so many different ways to describe it. Tart, ripe, fresh, baked, stewed, jammy, dried, desiccated. What does desiccated even mean? It's just kind of rotting a little bit. Or bruised fruits. Now, these are really important to be able to describe. And again, it's one of those things that it takes a little practice in smelling the things that you have in order to get the distinction. Whether you take a fresh strawberry and compare it to the taste and flavor of a jam versus dried or, or, or candied. Recently, I was packing my own, uh, my own grocery bags at the grocery store, and I decided to put my pears at the bottom of the bag. I bought fresh pears, but when I got home, I had bruised pears. <laughs> so it was a very uh, uh, a good learning thing for me because I'm like, oh yeah, bruised pears. That's what bruised pears smells like because <laughs> we describe wines often um, in that way. And taking all those little opportunities to smell uh, all of those different fruits when you have the opportunity. 
So what causes these different types of fruit character effects? A climate, whether the climate is warm or cool, will be definitely decide if um, a wine smells or tastes like green Granny Smith apples or round ripe yellow apples, um, or whether the 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 wine smells like stewed strawberries versus fresh strawberries. That could be the difference between a Zinfandel and a Chateauneuf de Pop uh, or dried strawberries. Those are those little small differences in these fruit characters are really important um, to help you distinguish wines that are can be very similar. Could be because of a vintage. Noting different vintages in Bordeaux alone, um, one vintage uh, between uh, between two vintages, you will find very, very diff different fruit characters uh, depending on the warmth or coolness of the vintage. And then also choices in that the winemaker makes in the vineyard, how ripe they pick the grapes versus how um, unripe, and then also uh, whether the grapes are raisinated, and also choices made in the winery as well. And what I mean by choices in the winery, sorry, I'll go back, um, is let's say you're talking about Amarone. And it, with Amarone, winemakers choose after the grapes are picked to raisinate them in the winery. So that is a winemaker choice and how the change can happen between a ripe piece of fruit and a dried piece of fruit uh, or the character that the fruit lends um, in, the, in winemaking decisions. I think one thing that can be helpful as you're going through either grid and you're describing fruit is to think category, noun, and adjective. So your category here, say, is citrus. Your noun is lemon, but then don't forget the adjectives. You know, that's a ripe lemon, a tart lemon. Um, so when you're describing things, think of the category, the noun, and make sure to have the adjectives that describe um, you know, the type of cherry or lemon or strawberry. That's awesome. That's a great point. Thank you. Our non-fruit character, I think if I were to pick the, some, two, a few of the most important lines on the grid, this would definitely be one of them. And that non-fruit character can be so many things, whether it's floral, vegetal, herbal, spice, animal or Britannomyces, that barn note, petrol or TDN, butter, cream, bubble gum, dough and beer. These non-fruit characters describe so many specific things about specific wines that it is important to really expand your knowledge and your, um, your using of these types of words. These are the impact compounds that we were talking about a moment ago, can be winemaking techniques and can be um, things that happened um, in the winery and in the vineyard, like I just mentioned. So floral, we find those wines that are heavy floral character, and I urge you to use whether the wine is um, light, medium, or heavy floral, or come up with uh, a, uh, a way of describing it for you that your brain can wrap around and notice if you use the word floral, that you're using it as a, as a light floral or a medium floral, or using flowers that are, are very potent. Because uh, if you say flowers for everything, you, you need to find a way for your brain to be able to distinguish the difference between something that is highly aromatic and something that just has a little bit um, of a floral character. I hear people use the word baby's breath a lot. <laughs> baby's breath don't really smell like anything, but I think about floral character as something like, can I, do I smell it first and then I'm looking for it? So let's say I'm on my bike ride and I smell the honeysuckles are coming out. I smell honeysuckles and then I'm looking around, okay, where are the honeysuckles? I smell it before I see it. Or is it a flower that I see the flower and I'm like, oh, let me walk over there and see what it smells like. Those type of florals are very different. And not that you have to be an expert in whether, uh, you know, going to the flower shop and, and being able to distinguish between every flower, but a few really important ones like roses or jasmine and honeysuckles and, and the potency of them are important to distinguish so that your brain can wrap it, its head around uh, the type of flowers that you're talking about. Veg, were you gonna say something to that? Well, I, th yeah, I think with something like floral, um, it can be helpful also to tie back to some of the actual um, causes that you talked about in your in your previous slide. And there can be multiple different um, chemical compounds that can cause floral aromas. And um, two to be aware of are esters and terpenes. And there are others um, that you can talk about. But for example, a lot of the l most young wines have a kind of slightly floral character caused um, by esters from the fermentation, and those will change 
um, you know, the longer it's been since the fermentation. And those are th those can be quite different than the terpenes that exist as precursors in the grapes. If you think if you taste a muscat grape and the, or a, a Gewurztraminer grape, even in the juice itself, it can be floral. Um, and and the, those, those kind of terpene driven floral aromas can be much more intense than some of the ester driven aromas that might fade um, with just a little bit of time and bottle, et cetera. Absolutely, and, and, and noting that what kind of grape varieties may show that. Um, again, on that intensity scale, is it a low, you know, one to five on a more of an ester scale? Um, or are we talking about terpenes when we start heading into like the five, six, like Riesling, Albarino camp, or are we, are we starting to really get into those highly terpenic um, grape varieties? And so I think that, thank you, that's a really great note. When we talk about vegetal or herbal, it's important to distinguish between the two of them because sometimes things have green notes that we need to be able to distinguish. Are it actual vegetables like asparagus or peppers? Is it as, as intense as a pyrazine or a pyrazine that we're talking about bell peppers or um, jalapenos? Or is it a light fresh herb? Is it herbal like rosemary or thyme or um, things like that that we find very fresh and, and in, a, in a field? Spices, we could be talking about black pepper or white pepper, or we could be talking about the spices noted in oak. Usually when we're talking about oak, we're talking about other types of spices, um, but here we could be talking about um, many different types of spices that um, would lend itself to unique flavors in the wine. Animal and barn for possibly Britannomyces. We talked about petrol um, in Riesling. Butter or cream, we would find through winemaking decisions through malolactic fermentation, and whether we find butter notes or more creamy notes. Bubble gum, we would note in carbonic maceration, and dough and beer would be because of lees contact. So find these. This category I can't express how important it is to be able to uh, describe these non-fruits and be able to expand your repertoire um, in this category to be able to hone in on very specific aromas for wines that can lead you down the correct path later. Next is earthy character. So we talk about earth and mineral in two separate categories. Earthy, we're talking about an effect of, we'll find forest floor, um, compost, mushrooms, potting soil, wet leaves and black tea. It's important to understand these notes and understand when you find earthy character, but keep it simple. Uh, I see a lot of um, very unique <laughs> tasting notes uh, for people, and but noting if it's there or if it's not, if it's forest floor versus compost, compost is a little more stinky as you probably noticed, or button mushrooms or potting soil, wet leaves, just keep the verbiage um, simple. Sometimes you really do notice something that is completely unique and different in that earthy category. But noting whether it's there or whether it's not there is the first is the most important thing. And then being able to describe it a little bit more fully uh, in very simple terms is okay too, is the second uh, most important thing. Next, for mineral character, same thing, noting that it's there, whether it's whetstone, limestone, chalk, or slate or flint, and the intensity of it, just like with um, the earthy character, whether it's intense or not, whether it's there or not, and being able to describe it. You are able to say just mineral, but give us a little bit more dis descriptor, like whether it's wet stone. I know it's very hard to distinguish the, the difference between limestone, chalk, slate, and flint. Yes, you can go out and start licking rocks. Sure, why not? <laughs> but really, the idea is noting the differences between them in certain wines. If you're able to distinguish chalk or what chalk feels like or tastes like, let's say, um, in um, a Chablis, for instance, whether that's real or not, or whether that association is, is true, um, being able to recognize it in certain wines is important, just being able to describe it as well. Yeah, I'd make an important note here, um, because I, I think obviously mineral is, um, is a really important way to describe wines, but, um, but I would um, make the distinction between cause and effect here, um, in the sense that, um, we are using terms like chalk or slate or something as evocative terms, um, but not as causation. Yeah. And so in the sense that, you know, when you're smelling something that you might describe as chalky, um, these are sulfur compounds that you're smelling. Um, and these are coming mostly from the actions of yeast. 
Um, and obviously the soy, the vineyard that it comes from, the juice chemistry affects the fermentation and how these compounds are created. But most of these compounds are, are sulfur compounds that come about during fermentation. So be very careful, don't make a one-to-one -one correlation between a smell you're smelling and the type of soil the wine was grown in. Um, that's a very romantic concept. Um, maybe it can be good for selling wine, but it, it, it's, it's not backed up by, by science and the chemistry. Um, and so I think um, talk about those things, use those descriptors, but be very careful when you're linking cause and effect between mineral of, you know, what the soil of the vineyard is versus what we're descriptively talking about um, that comes about in wine making. Absolutely. And that's why I mentioned keeping the verbiage simple. You don't have to be precious or while you're tasting, okay, is this chalk or is this slate necessarily? If it helps you, then then okay. But really that those finite differences uh, really um, can get you hung up on something that you don't need to be hung up on. Just keep moving forward, keep the verbiage simple, noting whether it's there, um, whether it's strong or it's it's weak. And or the not are there at all. For instance, let's say in a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc versus a Sancerre, that can help you decide the differences between some producers um, in that realm. And if you keep that verbiage simple, it may help you down the line. Next, we talk about wood or oak and the effect that we see that none you if there is no oak, there is no oak. So uh, the effect is that we see zero or no oak. And then we could further describe it as old versus new, large versus small, French versus American. And this is where we get into uh, that advanced level tasting, that to being able to describe uh, what it tastes like for a wine to be aged in older oak or those effects that we, are, that we see or those causes, and then the effect of large, small, or French or American. And so here, what we're talking about is the impression of oak. Is it low, moderate, or high? Um, is it because the wine was aged or fermented in a large vat or an old vat that we don't have a huge impression of oak, but there is some oxidative character or there is some impression of some spicy character or whatever it might be, where the opposite is the high impression of oak with new oak, small barrels that give an intense impression of oak. Whether it's French or American, using to describe French oak with vanilla or maybe even baking spices like cinnamon or nutmeg or sometimes even, even clove versus American oak that may have um, aromas and flavors of dill, coconut, caramel, um, or, even, or even bourbon. So this is the, the use, the causes, the use of the oak barrels are how much is used, the size and the type. And also this is a winemaking decision. So a winemakers or elevage decision here. Jeff, do you have anything you wanna mention on this one? Yeah, I do. And so I think um, most people are, are usually pretty good at detecting the amount of wood in white wine, because we you know the difference between say an unoaked Sancerre and a heavily oaked California Chardonnay. Um, we know those differences. Um, with red wines, I find that people sometimes assume a certain level of oak because it's a red wine, but it's really important to sit back and think, you know, how much new oak is on this wine? And one of my favorite things to, to ch ask people to do is think, you know, where on the, how big on the P&L line of the winery is the purchase of new oak? If you're tasting a wine and you're like, how much money did they have to spend to make that wine taste like that much oak? You know, is this something that that's a huge budget for me? You know, I was I asked this question when somebody has a wine in their hand and say, you know, did the winemaker get a Christmas card from the barrel salesman? Um, <laughs> well, you know, or a, or a car. Um, so um, I think really thinking about how much new oak is on a wine and asking yourself, okay, is there some effect of oak here, or is there a significant impact aroma caused by the use of lots of new barrels? And here you can apply your theory knowledge as well, because uh, looking, well, two things I want to mention here is one, um, because there's this huge middle ground of like older, large, or no new oak, as you mentioned. But I think that that larger question is, is um, the impact that the oak has. And then the kind of chasm is, if it doesn't have a huge impact, then how am I describing it? And how can I learn to differentiate certain wines from each other based on that? So we talk about French or American oak, but then we can also talk about 
European, different Salonian and uh, Salonian oak and different other, other types of European oak that are widely used. And those descriptors get a little bit more, um, more intricate and are harder to find. And these are the wines I'm talking about, like, um, like when we're describing Brunello and Montalcino or we're describing Chateauneuf du Pape. Knowing how those wines are made and understanding wine law can help you um, in this distinction. I mean, a lot of times we, we talk, I hear people, and I did this myself until I kind of really dove into um, how wines are made, is putting like Brunello and Chateauneuf de Pop and Rioja in the same trifecta. And when you think about winemaking and when you think about oak usage, those wines do not even have to be in that same category because we're talking about three very, very different um, types of winemaking and all having to do with oak or no oak. Uh, with, uh, with Rioja using new oak, a lot, or American oak a lot of the times, um, sometimes French oak these days too, to Chateauneuf de Pop that on most cases, and we don't do not use new oak at all. More uh, um, cement or best. And then we have Brunello de Montalcino in, in large casks um, of Slavonian oak often. So it, when we dive deep into how these mines are made, you can find these really expressive distinctions that ha can help put to bed a lot of those uh, trifectas or those easily confused wines. Sometimes, people, sorry, go ahead. You can think of it as winemakers are very good at tasting oak and wines because it, as a winemaker, if you want to go buy, get a used barrel, you know, for something, it, say it might cost you $100 to get a used barrel and you're going to make 25 cases of wine out of that. To get a new barrel is going to cost you over $1,000. So if you can taste the wine and say, all right, did this cost over $1,000 in oak to make 25 cases? Or is it something, you know, that I could have done for $100? And obviously when a winemaker is spending that $1,000, they're going to know the difference between those two wines. And it's something as a blind taster, you should um, really be able to learn to, to distinguish. One other distinction I find um, that runs pe people in the trouble, and even myself, I did, again, I did this recently, <laughs> um, is the idea of lees versus oak. That's often one that is um, mistaken. So the idea that lees can cause a slight vanilla character, or um, I don't want to go as far as saying toasty, but the, the yeast causes an aroma that people, um, myself included, have mistaken for oak in the past. And again, I guess it was Alvarino again. I did it again with an Alvarino recently. I tasted it. And I'm like, is there oak on this one? And it wasn't oak. It was just uh, the and, least. And maybe also what could contribute to that is diacetyl. Um, mm -hmm. in, of malolactic fermentation, creating diacetyl. A lot of Albarino is going to go through a malolactic fermentation. Um, and depending on how you do that, you could leave various amounts of diacetyl in the wine and diacetyl gives that kind of buttery taste that you can, you can easily confuse the taste of diacetyl with the taste of oak. Right, and, and that goes back to your theory knowledge on compounds or winemaking techniques like um, malolactic fermentation and, and how they're presented and lees contact and how they present themselves in the wine. And a winemaker's choice, whether that diacetyl shows up or not, and whether um, that uh, it presents itself as a, a buttery character or whether it um, presents itself as a creamy note. And those, as I mentioned before, are all winemaking decisions. Great. So next, we finally, finally, hey, Bobby, move on to the palate. So the first thing we do when we get to the palate is to review. Now, some people I know, um, and, and I, meant, I meant to mention this before, and I guess I should do this now because this is important, is that to choose what works best for you in terms of working with the grid. Now, this is the grid that we have set forth in a certain um, in a certain uh, uh, methodology going through, but you can make it your own. Knowing what be best works for you and your body and your taste buds, all of those things. And that's a really important thing to know here because many people start off with some uh, structural elements when they uh, review the palate. So they may start off with sweetness and body. They could start off with the entire structural uh, note of the wine and then move back to the fruit and fruit and condition. You can do it any way you like. Whatever makes sense to you, whatever works for you is the most important thing, just knowing that. But here we're going to be talking about fruit first and then we're going to be talking about the structural elements later. 
So the first thing we have here is reviewing the fruit, fruit condition, non-fruit, earth, mineral, and wood. And that is a pretty um, straightforward in terms of what you have seen in the wine, reviewing um, the fruit character. But the big thing to note here is, is something changed? Now, going through that road, yeah, I confirm lemon, I confirm lime, I confirm peaches, whatever it might be, but that is fine. But really, this is your time to slow down and see what is happening or what happened in the wine. Did the fruit change? Was the fruit ripe strawberries on the nose and became tart strawberries, tart cranberries, and um, uh, maybe some craisins or something on the palate? What happened? What changed with the fruit? What changed with the not fruit? Do you notice earth on the palate and you didn't notice it on the nose? Do you, did you not notice the earth on the nose and here you're noticing the earth and mineral on the palate? Did you, were you not so sure about what was happening with the oak on the nose, but on the palate, you're going to give your full evaluation. This again is one of the most important parts of your entire tasting. Noticing that difference is what's going to get you or start leading you down the correct area of the field to get to the, the most accurate conclusion. So then we move on to structure. And we, first of all, we talk about sweetness. Is there perceptible sweetness in the wine? Meaning, is there perceptible sugar left over in winemaking in the wine? We describe this as bone dry, dry, off dry, medium sweet, and sweet. I know there are so many descriptors and how each of us uses them is different. For me, noting whether the wine was bone dry or dry really had to do with, um, wow, I mean, so many things, but dry was pretty reserved, bone dry, excuse me, was pretty reserved for old world wines or white wines um, that just really were just uh, nearly austere. And then dry, maybe a little bit more of a ripeness, more towards kind of maybe new world uh, uh, or riper wines. And then off dry, medium sweet is in, is hard to tell the difference between some, but in terms of German Riesling, in terms of um, other uh, wines with perceptible residual sugar, and then the other ones, sweet and luscious, lusciously sweet, reserved for definitively sweet wines. Meaning, I don't wanna give grams per liter here, but we're talking about the, I don't wanna say the dessert wines of the world, but um, of the um, notably sweet wines of the world. And there's one more category or one more area I wanted to mention, and that is that idea of that in between the dry or off dry, those wines that show a little bit of perceptible sugar, like you're noticing a few grams, but generally the wine is pretty dry, but you're noticing a few grams of residual sugar. I find that in wines like sometimes Bouvray and Pinot uh, Gris from Alsace, maybe even some, some um, Riesling from Alsace, that, and maybe even some um, um, Schmarag to uh, Gruner Veltliner, that the wine is generally dry, but you're finding just a few grams of residual sugar that are important to mention. And, and that could also be the case in, in red wines as well. You can even get some red wines, um, which will have a, a, a tiny bit of residual sugar. Think of Amarone, even some Zinfandels, um, even some Cabernets, you know, can have some, a touch of, you know, uh, residual sugar. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that, because that's like um, the residual sugar. I know I was mentioning in white wines, so that's a great uh, way to segue into the red wines or the vinification and the choices winemakers have. And that's that it, it's complicated. <laughs> that, you're talking about a red wine, but if you're mentioning um, some residual sugar, and it should be some something to look for in red wines for sure, and that will maybe even give you that that distinction between Chateauneuf de Pop or Zinfandel if that's a, a sticky point, and definitely for Amarone, uh, noticing that vinification technique and leaving a little bit of residual sugar in that wine. Next, we have phenolic bitterness. <laughs> So what is phenolic bitterness? It's a way of describing uh, red wines, bitterness in red wines, that, or excuse me, white wines, that we're going to reserve this distinction, phenolic bitterness for white wines and then tannins for red wines. And that is a yes or no question, uh, whether you're finding it or not. And it's a good thing to look for because it really describes and distinguishes certain grape variety. And this comes from phenols in the grapes and is a 
is caused during vent, well, certain grape varieties can have these phenols, but also vinification techniques can be used to express them more fully or not at all. Um, and specific grape varieties have this phenolic bitterness. For instance, Pinot Grigio would be one of them, or Pinot Gris. That would be a great way, a bitter component in Pinot Gris from all sauces. It's definitely a great way to distinguish that grape variety. Um, what else can we find it in highly aromatic or terpenic grape varieties, the Virginia, um, we can find it in Viognier, we can find it in Muscat. And then other grape varieties that we may find vin uh, bitterness in, maybe Gruner, Veltliner, but often vinification techniques can exacerbate that bitter character or it can diminish that bitter character. Yeah, and, and these can these bitterness, as far as I understand, can, can phenols being one main class of them, but terpenes themselves can actually be bitter. So sometimes yeah. the bitterness is not just of the phenol compound, um, but there are other compounds that can cause bitterness as well in wines. But I think that bitterness in white wines is a really uh, important um, way to distinguish between certain classic styles. Yes, I think that's a great distinction here, um, is the phenols versus the terpenes causing um, that bitterness. And that distinction is really important when you know, describing uh, certain wines. So thank you, that's a really good distinction. Next, we can describe tannins. We'll reserve um, this for red wines. And the effect that we find, we describe it as low, medium, minus, medium, medium plus, and high. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of different just effects here, um, depending on the grape variety, viticulture, vinification, of course. And um, the things that we're looking for here are being able to describe them, being able to calibrate your pan palate um, as to how these feel on your palate, whether intensity, here we're talking about intensity, whether the intensity is low, medium minus, medium plus or high, and being able to distinguish that in certain types of wines. Remember I talked about that idea of certain grape varieties or certain wines play in certain sandboxes and being you may be able to camp these grape varieties or wines into these categories of low, medium, minus, medium, plus, and high. So when you find them, you can think about, all right, I am in a high tannin grape variety camp. Which grape varieties provide high tannin? Pretty much all the time. There's two, maybe three at best that do that. Same for low, those big bookends or those big extremes and then working in from there can help you wrap your brain around what certain wines do, how they play and what to look for when you find them in a tasting. In terms of viticulture, um, it, ripeness definitely have, plays a part in how the tannins present themselves. Um, physiological ripeness and how ripe the grape skins are can help play a role. And then vinification, how the wine is made in the winery. When we can be talking about you know, extraction um, of flavor, but also extraction of tannins in certain winemaking techniques. Great. Now we can we always talk about how the intensity what the what the intensity of tannins are like I mentioned low medium minus medium plus high but then how do they feel I think that is the next category to really be thinking about because there's so many grape varieties that have medium plus tannins so how do you describe them a little more fully or a little bit more meaningfully that can have an impact on how you, how you are perceiving the wine we can use uh, textural descriptors, maybe if they're gritty, if they're sandy, if they're smooth, if they're velvety. How are they playing on your palate to give you a little bit more descriptor to tell the difference between that Malbec or that California Merlot, or whether um, you think it's a new world or old world wine, because sometimes winemaking technique really goes into that, how the winemaker chose to present those tannins. Maybe I'm not, I don't want to group all Australian wines into one group or all New World wines into one group, but sometimes they do play a little bit more on that velvety side, or many Old World wines really have that kind of gritty, sandy, grippy side, and that can help you determine between two types of wines when you describe the tannins, not only in intensity, but also in texture and how they feel. Next, we want to talk about acidity. And acidity can be the same way. All of these descriptors of low, medium, minus, medium plus, and high, and the cause, you know, the acidity in the wine is caused by the grape variety, 
The climate plays a huge role in the amount of acidity. Cooler climates tend to have higher acid or highest, higher acidity, viticulture, when the grapes are picked, and of course, vinification. What I mean by grape varieties is that certain grape varieties, again, can be grouped into that higher acid, um, medium plus acid or medium minus acid. Climate determines it because the, um, the cooler the climate, the elevated um, acid, the more elevated the acid is, and the warmer climate, uh, the more diminished the acidity. Viticulture, when did the winemaker choose to pick these grapes? Did they pick them earlier to preserve acidity? Did they pick them later to have a little bit less acidity and more ripeness? And then vinification, we can't forget about the idea of acidification. The acidification does happen and it can present itself in um, as the wine having higher acidity than you would normally think. Many people I've seen, in my, again, myself included, uh, the idea of a Shiraz that has elevated acidity. Well, why not? If it has acidity or if it was acidified, it, you don't have to steer away from Australian Shiraz just because it has elevated acidity because it doesn't fit into that model that we have in our mind of old world versus new world in terms of acidity. Again, describing the acidity more fully, not only in terms of its intensity, but how it feels can also help you describe the acidity and maybe describe um, the wine a little further for you to understand it. So for instance, what does this acidification taste like for you on the palate? Does it taste like baby aspirin like it does for somebody? Some people, does it make your mouth water in weird places like uh, and unusually um, as compared to other medium plus or high acid wines? These are all things that you can look at um, in your own body and how you perceive different acid acidities to be able to describe it more fully and be able to come to a better conclusion about the wine. Okay. Next, alcohol. The effect is obviously low, medium plus, me, medium minus, medium plus and high. And the cause, definitely grape variety, climate, viticulture and vinification, all the same things. Certain grape varieties tend to higher alcohols and others not. The climate plays a huge role. The vintage plays a huge role in how much the, the potential alcohol of the wine. When did the winemaker pick the grape again and the vinification techniques used in the winery, the alcoholization and other things. The body, we're talking about how the wine feels on the palate, whether the wine is light, medium, or full. And this is because of dry extract, alcohol, and residual sugar. We often use the uh, whole milk, skim milk, low fat milk, 2%, 1%, whatever you wanna say, um, how it feels or how it coats your palate. But remembering that this can be because of alcohol, often it is linked because alcohol creates body, but then also residual sugar creates body as well. Texture. Texture is a line that was um, recently put in to the grid and it was put in to be able to describe a wine more clearly or having an understanding of what is happening in the wine. Now, not every wine has a texture you have to mention. There isn't every single wine you have to make up a texture just to fill in that blank. The reason this line is in the grid is for you to be able to describe the wine or something in the wine that is going on in the wine to help you come to a better conclusion. The things we see are creamy or round or lean, oily, gas bubbles perhaps, bitter phenolics and tannins. These all create textures in the mouth that can help um, put together all of your descriptors or help you lead you down the right um, lane toward a, a, a logical conclusion. This usually has to do with grape variety. Certain grape varieties can produce really oily, round, rich wines like Viognier or even Semillon can create that waxy, oily texture. Or like I mentioned, Viognier. And then um, creamy or round can be caused by uh, malolactic fermentation. So if you have that kind of creamier round note, um, that might be from something that happened in the winery. Um, and then climate can play a role there too. And obviously with viticulture and vinification. Did you have anything you wanna mention there, Jeff? Yeah, are, are you at the end of, um, of the palette now at this point? Yeah, so this is the last one, kind of the texture, kind of bring home all of those things that you tasted, but then noticing some other things, other textures that may 
help you in your um, in your conclusion. So I'd like to make two points on the whole kind of structure uh, section here, uh, okay. suggestion. Um, the first is to be very careful with, um, I, you know, when I, when I used to uh, do advanced, great advanced exams, I remember, I don't know if you still see this, but a lot of people would have um, the, a disease which I would call MPS, um, medium plus syndrome. Yeah. Um, medium plus syndrome is where you basically go through the structure and you call everything medium plus, yeah. right? right. Um, and we t you tend to see that a lot um, as, as people are kind of learning uh, blind tasting. Now, things can be medium plus. You can have a wine where everything is medium plus. This exists. But in general, it's the highs, it's the medium minuses. Um, these are the things that really help you frame the wine. So don't be afraid um, to call things high, to call things medium minus when it's there, because that's going to really help you identify certain wines. Um, when you get a wine that is high acid, high alcohol, you know, um, medium minus acid, that, that's a really important factor. The second thing that I would mention is when you're doing structure, take an extra second. So, um, you know, you have to get, you're getting through wines in, the, in a fairly quick time frame. But when you're talking about alcohol, acid, tannin, take a second, sit back, make sure you're getting it right. And sometimes it takes a few seconds for acid to really build on your palate. So don't rush through the structure part. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons I mentioned it earlier before is do it in a way that makes sense to you or evaluate the palate in a way that makes sense to you is that if that makes sense to you to do the structural elements first, then go ahead by all means. From me personally, I preferred to wait until later till my palate acclimatized to the wine until I was able to fully evaluate the um, structural elements. And so I saved them for later so that I could have the time to describe the wine, let the wine do its thing on my palate, and then go back one more time and kind of sit with it, take a second, because the structure is the heart of the wine. All these other things can change, you know, certain flavors, but really the soul of the wine, getting that um, acid, tannin um, structure and alcohol structure correct is really a big deal. And taking your time with it, not rushing through it, and, um, and making sure you're evaluating it authentically, not what you want it to be, but what it truly is based on, um, and not based on everything else you said, but really what truly it is. So is this the last slide before we get into initial conclusions? Um, this is you one more, but it's a short one. Okay, go ahead. I'll let you finish. That. I mean, it's just like the initial conclusion one. Um, I mean, the balance and uh, I wasn't just wanting to see if there was anything else I should be saying uh, about texture. Just mainly that textures just really can, can be very definitive of certain grape varieties, I guess. Is, I guess I already said that though. <laughs> okay. All right. Lastly, after you review texture and you've really gotten a good picture of the wine, you're looking at balance. Does any one element dominate? Um, for me, like saying things like this, like really this is a very tannic wine. This is a NASA driven wine. There's really to kind of get your brain wrapped around what is happening with this wine and what is the big picture. Length and finish, um, we we're talking about things that are uh, how, long does the wine stay on your palate? How does it finish? And complexity. So we can use things like short, medium, minus, medium plus, or long or high. And it usually has to do with quality or how um, quality or, or even structural elements of the wine. A lot of times I like to look at it as things like, um, especially the length, how long does it stay on my palate, but also how does it finish? What does it finish with? Is it an oaky finish? Is it a tart finish? Is it an acidic finish? To describe that a little bit more fully for myself so that I could distinguish between different, different grape varieties. Before we dive into the initial and final conclusion, I think it is important to remember you know, why we've used the grid in the first place and to remember that the grid is your guide. And that guide is like a mantra. So one of the most important things you can do for yourself is memorizing the grid and it becoming a mantra, something that you can hold on to, something that you can rely on, because the last thing you need is to get to your initial conclusion and wonder if you made your oak call or wonder if you remembered to say acidity or tannins or any of your structural calls. 
when you memorize the grid it be, and it becomes a mantra to you that you can take comfort and you can rely on its predictability that you did cover it that you did your homework you used uh, the methodology to get to this place and tasting the same way every single time is really important so when you start getting into that mode for studying for an exam, let's say that you do the same thing in the same way every single time so that it is predictable. And you, as I mentioned before, you take comfort in knowing that you have covered all the things you needed to cover so that your brain can rely on the information you provided it and you can pick through the information. Now that all depends on you having done this authentically. Because I, like everyone else, have smelled the wine and have decided the entire grid based on what we thought the wine was instead of using the deductive knowledge or using each line authentically and on its own and objectively all the way through till we get to this point. And that takes repetition, that takes practice, that takes um, a lot of motivation, but I promise it will pay off in dividends if you do. Because the last thing, as I said, you need to do is be worrying about at this point if you forgot to get a point here or there or mention something on the grid. So with that in mind, let's move on to where we are talking about what we will talk about for the initial conclusion. I like your um, I like your idea of the mantra. Can I make one suggestion with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can think of it as sort of the, the structure of the grid being the mantra, mm -hmm. but the should not be part of the mantra. So to me, there's a difference between medium plus acid, medium plus alcohol, medium plus tannin, right? Don't let that be the mantra. Let the mantra be the alcohol is, the tannin is, the, right. you know, the, um, the body is, whatever that is, and then stop and add in your answer, but don't let the answer become part of the mantra. Um, right. Let the wine answer you, you know, let the wine answer it. Yes. Um, but, but don't just throw these things, because I've heard that before where people's actually, they get into a rhythm where it's mm -hmm. actually, it's almost like rote answers as opposed to rote structure. Does that make sense? No, no, absolutely. Because you want the structure, yeah, the mantra to be you hitting all the points, but you, your brain is able to pull out of it and give an authentic answer to the thing. Yeah, right. absolutely. I think, uh, um, and that, that again is an important dis distinction, uh, noting that you, you do it the same way every time so that you have that mantra. And even like we talked about before, the rule, the, those three things you say for color, you know, whether it be the you know, intensity, the actual color, and any hues. And then for, with fruit, it's the three things of the noun or the category, the noun, and the descriptor. And those things are done the same way every time. But then there's like a little bit of a blank space open for the authentic answer to come through. Nice, cool. And that's, I think, here where, where we have a stop sign here is just stop and take a moment. So when you hit that initial conclusion, it's like a reset button in order for you to take into account all those things that you said previously. Take a breath, take a second, you know, for you to kind of um, reset your body and reset your mind and move forward. And here is where we talk about that idea of funneling, the idea of big rocks, or on the guilt site, we also have the game of 20 questions. So you're picking out some of the things that are the most important things about the wine that you can hold on to. So you're funneling all this information into the big rocks, the big ideas, the most important things, applying your theory knowledge to those, and then the mental game being, are you stable or is your mind stable enough that you have the wherewithal to process that information that you have given to come to a logical conclusion? And this has to do with things that you found on the site, whether it be intensity or color, what you found on the nose in terms of fruit, earth, or um, an oak, and then um, palette and structure. What things stand out the most funnel those things the most that are the most important things about the wine and bring those down to your logical conclusion. So first we start with the possible grape varieties. So the effect is, is it a single variety or is it a blend? And we use variety markers 
the regional presence of those varieties, climate matches, and structure. Now these things are, oh, and of course, winemaking. So these things all have to do with theory knowledge, as I was mentioning. Do you know um, the, the variety, the markers for a variety? Let's say you have Chinon. Um, where does it grow? <laughs> does it make sense for what you were saying? Um, does it match the climate that you have described? And the structure, um, the structure of the wine, does it match up for that grape variety? And in terms of winemaking, too. Oftentimes, I'll think about the grape varieties or the possible grape varieties. Maybe you can throw in a couple, uh, three, let's say, and they all need to be pretty similar. I know sometimes it's hard to, to distinguish between a few different grape varieties, but over time with this practice, you will find that there's such um, dis, um, disparate nature of so many different grape varieties and way the way they are made and their climate matches that you can knock out on um, some of those uh, things that have held you up in, in the past. The next thing is old world or new world. And that is the presence of earthy character or not, the structure, which is usually climate related, fruit quality, whether it's, it changes from the nose to the palate, is it very ripe, is it dried, is it raisinated? Um, what is the oak component? Is it a very oaky wine, more subtly oaky wine? Sometimes that has to do with old world, new world or not. So knowing that that can be part of the conversation, but um, often is not. The finish of the wine, is it more fruity or is it more acidic? And then also looking at specific varieties. Um, if you're calling a, um, I don't know, like to say Cabernet Franc from uh, <laughs> the new world, I mean, how many of those? There are quite a few, but noticing that you're, you're calling the new world or old world based on a specific grape variety that makes sense for your next conclusion. Next, we take a look at climate, whether it's cool, moderate, or warm. And this is caused by the fruit quality, ripeness, structure, um, like the acidity, the alcohol of the wine, and the tannin. Often for climate and old world or new world, I give reasons for it to make sure I'm on track. Because let's say if I go to old world and or go to old world, new world and say, uh, I think this wine is new world because of its predominantly uh, earthy character. Okay, wait a minute. All right. So I would try to say a reason why I think it is old world or new world to make sure I'm on, on track. Because if the whole time I was talking about earthy, 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 or minerally, 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 and then suddenly... I'm going to New World, I have to have a reason for it. Of course, there could be a reason for it. And maybe you're hem hedging between a, a Sauvignon Blanc from Sancerre in New Zealand or a Cabernet uh, from a very ripe, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from a ripe vintage of Bordeaux or from Napa. Um, there's always reasons for that, but giving yourself a fighting chance to make sure that you're giving uh, a, a reason for your answer. And same with climate. Climate. If I say it's a cool climate because of the elevated acidity, and all along I talked about medium or medium minus acidity, I have to notice that uh, my, my notes are not jiving and noticing how these things came to be or the causes of these climatical effects. Can, um, so I really like the slide on climate, and that's, a, I think, a huge thing for, for me in identifying wines. On the kind of old world versus new world. Um, yes, yeah, tricky, kind of, tricky. I'm not personally a fan of the old world, new world as, as even being a, a term or something because I, um, I'm not saying there aren't things that we can talk about in that sense, but, but um, do, you, do you, is it descriptive? Because obviously you can have an old world, a wine made in the old world that's in a new world style. Yeah, or you can have so a wine in, the new world that's in an old world style. So if you're asking people to say old or new world, are you asking them to uh, describe the style or where it's from, or are you always making an assumption that an old world wine will be old world in style and a new world wine will be new world in style? Yeah, I think that assumption isn't always, you know, applicable, right, um, for every single wine. But I think as you're heading into your initial conclusion, it's just a way of funneling down some of the information. Because of course, there are so many um, wines that we can talk about that um, can straddle those lines um, that you're just heading in a general direction. But there are plenty of times where you're like, well, I'm not sure new world or old world am I initial yet? <laughs> Let me get to my final conclusion and, um, and go from there. 
see that a lot. And it, whether it be dry Riesling, whether it be, you know, whether it be from Australia or whether it be from um, somewhere in the old world, there's so many examples I can give in that case that it is hard in initial conclusion there. But, you know, really, I, I don't feel like it's not going to make or break your tasting. If you're heading down a, uh, a direction and you, this is the initial conclusion. So you're starting to narrow it down and maybe you don't know at the moment, just like you don't know, possibly between three different grape varieties, you're still kind of trying to make that call. They are just kind of funneling the information to move on to the final conclusion. Great, thanks. Yeah. Next, we go ahead into our possible countries. And of course, we, uh, well, which country are we picking? Uh, and we need to make sure we're using regional markers based on the, the grape variety we're talking about climate and variety matches, like making sure that the countries we are mentioning um, match and also the wine law um, of, of the grape variety that wine laws determining the grape varieties that grow in certain places for our initial conclusion. And making sure they match up to what you said. So if you mentioned, you know, um, you know, Sangiovese, Tempranillo, and Chateau de Pop at an initial co co conclusion uh, that you're mentioning France, Italy, and Spain in your uh, possible countries. So when we talk about age range, um, we are talking about uh, fruit quality, what we found the fruit quality to be, whether it be a very fresh or dried. Um, um, we can look at structural elements. We can look at tertiary aromas and flavors and integration of flavors. Uh, we can talk about the effect being, or the thing that we um, will be looking for is one to three, three to five, or five to 10, or 10 years plus. But when we look at different uh, types of wine, we need to think about what's most appropriate for the wine itself. So if we were tasting a very youthful wine, like let's say this Spy Valley Sauvignon Blanc, um, what is most appropriate for that type of wine? Are we talking one to three, three to five, five to 10? And I know in our nervousness, sometimes we just throw out vintages, but this is part of the practice of using the grid and uh, the mantra and coming up with an open answer. If you're heading down to a very youthful um, white wine that you're thinking one to three years old, and it's very simple math, kind of math that I can do, you know, uh, whatever the year is minus uh, one to three, it's easy math. <laughs> But then we start looking at wines that have oak aging. We have to think about the theory of vinification. How long it would it take or how long do these types of wines typically stay in oak or how long are they rested or bottle aged or both? We're gonna talk about like a Merceau here um, that we could back up a couple of vintages or one vintage or two based on the oak aging if it's youthful, or the type of aromas and flavors we're finding. We talk about Brunello di Montalcino or even Rioja. We need to take into account wine law and what an appropriate vintage would be, not only based on the aromas and flavor, but um, as I mentioned, on wine law. Once you become a more advanced or master level tasting is when you're diving in to specific vintages, when you're calling 10 plus years or more. You can see the uh, the bottle here, Pichon Baron, and the idea of what is not only appropriate for the age of the wine, but what an appropriate vintage would be for that call. That you're making an assumption based on the aromas and flavors and every vintage is different. Are you calling a ripe vintage? Are you calling an underripe vintage? Are you calling a very ripe vintage? And, um, and all of that entails there. Again, when you see the Chateau um, Bocastel, a 2000 Bocastel, if you're calling an age 10 to 20 year old Chateauneuf de Pop, what vintages of Chateauneuf de Pop would be appropriate for the flavors that you're finding in the wine? Do you think it's more important than, obviously at this point you're just talking about an age range, but do you think it's more important to, um, to get a vintage which just makes sense? Are you looking to say, okay, if once I'm in this range, five to 10 years, at that point you're saying which vintages could make sense or how much is there an expectation of actually getting the specific vintage? I think uh, it, it could be a vintage range. I mean, depending on the wine um, for a typical exam, but for a master level taster that you have the wherewithal uh, to 
come up with a range that you recognize a, a 10 to 20 year old wine, one, and then two, being able to pick an appropriate vintage in the final conclusion. And of course there will be a range. It's not like it has to be exactly every single time, but a master level taster will be able to come up with an appropriate vintage um, in the final conclusion or um, within a couple of vintages. That makes sense for them. I like that concept of an appropriate vintage as opposed to an exact vintage, because you can't always tell exact oh. vintage, but you can tell if you're, once you're within a range, you can tell what an appropriate vintage would be. Correct. Yes. And I think that that is a, another um, a great way of putting it, because there are some that are very similar, but let's say in a very, like a, calling a terrible vintage in a wine that is really delicious at 19 years old or 20 years old, right? You know, so that you're you're calling an appropriate uh, quality vintage for the quality of the wine. Does that make Great. more sense? Okay, cool. Thank you. And then for your final conclusion, um, you're just hammering it home. You're going straight to the grape variety or blend, country, region, appellation, quality level, and vintage. Often here, if I gave three varieties in my initial conclusion, I'm still not kind of sure which one it is. Here's where I say why. And I say why it is this grape because it helps me remember that I said, of what I said in my tasting, those things that meant the most. Because I said, oh, because I said, um, whether it be terpenes, I'm just naming a few really important things, leaves, terpenes, uh, uh, like I said, oak, um, different types of um, evaluative structural elements is why I'm going to go with this grape variety. These were the most important things I said, so this is why I'm going to go with grape variety, this grape variety. But then you're able to kind of check yourself because if you didn't say any of those things during your tasting, then maybe it's not the right one. But you can choose the right one based on the things that you said and the things that you said in your grid most authentically. And remembering this is part of your mantra. This is part of your mantra to say the grape variety or the bun, country, region, appellation, quality level, vintage. Saying them all, all the way through um, in order to, to get the full, full final conclusion. Um, so, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Because this is such yeah. a big slide here. Do you mind if I ask yeah. you a few questions on a few of these? Mm -hmm. So, starting off of grape variety and blend, once you're, did the transition between initial and final here, um, can you talk a little bit about kind of the importance of laterals in grape variety? So that if you if you mention a grape that you think it may be in your initial, of just knowing yourself what other kind of laterals or similar grapes do you always want to have in the back of your mind so that you don't, you know, forget because it's easy in the moment to sort of forget and go oh god if i would have thought about zinfandel or if i would have thought about you know uh gruner i might have actually got it but i i got i got this certain grape in my initial and i forgot to kind of think through all the laterals right i think that's a, a good point i think laterals are different for um for everyone but there are some typical laterals that people um i speak of when We've mentioned a couple of times the idea of uh, Sangiovese and Nebbiolo, of course, those two always um, are always laterals with each other, but meaning that they have sometimes similar colors, sometimes similar aromas, similar flavors, but and sometimes similar structure, depending, but, um, but really being honest about those differences. And here in that sort of a lateral, I think it is Nebbiolo because of I think it is San Giovese because of, and in in and one of those things, uh, it, it's individual for each person. But for me, in that instance, it would have been something like, you know, if I was going with San Giovese and I said it's San Giovese because of the extremely high uh, tannin, alcohol, acidity, and uh, dried fruit character, <laughs> I would have been like, oh, wait, hold on a second here. <laughs> hold on. Um, or I think it's San Giovese because of, uh, you know, maybe some of the more herbal characters or um, the, the type of wood or things like that. You really have to think there and you have to be able to have the wherewithal to take the time um, to think about what it is you said authentically in your tasting and that's where the big rocks come in or the or funneling the information down for yourself into the most important parts 
and doing your homework um, with regards of winemaking, well, great varieties of the world, winemaking technique, um, viticultural techniques, and what's happening today in the wine world. Because so much is changing that you have to be able to keep in mind um, quite a few possibilities of what could be happening in the wine world. We talk about Tempranillo and Sangiovese and uh, Chateau de Pop. We talked about those as laterals. Again, when you look through the winemaking technique of how those wines are made, they're nothing alike, and they can easily be distinguished a lot of times by oak and structure alone. So for white wines, people talk about the trifecta of Pinot Grigio, Albarino, um, Gruner Veltliner. Any others I should add to that? Um, I think those three uh, are important because of the fact that um, you know, there are a lot of similarities with regards to Lee's contact, sometimes bit, uh, bitter phenolics um, and other aromas. But for me, you could kind of check out uh, Albarino out of there because of its terpenes, you know, because a terpenic character and looking for those other things about the wines um, that could be more influential. I would confuse dry Riesling probably um, with Alvarino sometimes before I would confuse Pinot Grigio or, or uh, Gruner Veltliner there. And really defining for yourself uh, authentic, meaningful to you descriptors of the non-fruits is, well, is one way to go. Jeff, do you have any other laterals you would mention? Like Pinot Noir or Gamay? There's so many, but it was just mostly to, to, to emphasize the concept of before you hang your hat on a grape, right. I think it is helpful to make sure you know your laterals. Is there anything you could be forgetting that you want to make sure you've you know thought about and ruled out? Because then for me, once you've got grape variety, once you say grape variety or a blend based on a grape variety, the next things here, country, region, and appellation, depending on the wine, may all follow. One or more of those may automatically follow. So for example, let's say um, Tempranillo. Let's say we've decided this is Tempranillo. At this point, country and region and even appellation pretty much follow, right? At that point, you'd be like, okay, if you've got a blind Tempranillo, where's it gonna be from? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, is, right. You, you're, you're all the way, you're going to follow. And, and so certain things are going to follow and certain things are not. So let's say you think this is Chardonnay. Now, country of origin does not follow from that, right? You can't, you, you country of origin, you got to go, okay, well, now is this a, am I going to look for a country where they make a warm climate style, a cool climate style? Um, where other things here, if you say Sangiovese, uh, country of origin, we know that's Italy. Region, we know that's Tuscan. So regions already filled in here by just saying essentially Sangiovese. Appalachian, now that's different. Is this a Brunello or is this more typical of a Chianti? In that case, I think there's a distinction. And the same might be true of Syrah. Let's say you could say, okay, Syrah. I'm at Syrah, I know this is Syrah. Country of origin. Well, is this a, is this, now this could be a French Syrah, could be Australian Syrah, could be an American Syrah. Okay, I think this is a French Syrah. Now at that point, Rhone follows, right? Because if you have a Syrah and you know it's from France, you know it's from the Rhone. Right. Yeah. So that follows. But then Appalachian, you do have a discussion because is this an Appalachian that might make a thirty dollar bottle of wine or a hundred dollar bottle of wine? Right. And so there, you know, your San Joseph versus Croze Hermitage is a different distinction from, say, maybe a Cote Roti or an Hermitage. And so, so I don't know if you, what you think about this, but kind of thinking about which things will automatically follow from determining that grape versus which things you need to stop and ask yourself, you know, um, where do where do I need to make a distinction? Yeah, and I think the key ones that you just mentioned, like Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Syrah, that's a that's a big deal um, in terms of because you you've determined kind of in your um, initial conclusion whether you're heading into the old world or new world, but or even Sauvignon Blanc. So even here. If you're finally here and you and you haven't chosen or you may change your mind, um, whether it be a Bordeaux Blanc or a, um, a Sauvignon Blanc base blend from Napa. Right. So here is where you are, are making your final decision. So when you pick the grape variety blend, I think this is, you know, Sauvignon Blanc uh, base blend. And I am. 
I'm going with France because of its more mineral character, the, um, the, the fruit is less ripe, or you can give yourself reasons um, and then it can follow, um, follow through. Is that kind of the point you were making? You can almost think of it as like when you're going through a web form, you know, and you're selecting things and it changes what your options are. Once you've selected, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, there's multiple countries there. You know, there's New Zealand, there's France, there's the, you know, the United States. But once you've selected France for region, there's really two options, right? This could be from the Loire or this could be from Bordeaux. And then once you select Loire, you know, your Appalachians are, and, and I might even argue there's not a whole lot of distinction, like, ability to, to decide like okay i'm not really concerned personally if you think this is a can see or you think this is whatever <laughs> you know, right. or, yeah so, or sancerre yeah there move on um one so other then, thing i was going to make mention really quickly about laterals is when i was studying for my masters i realized there were some unknown laterals that i didn't realize were there until i was making mistakes on certain wines so for instance let's say zinfandel or chateauneuf de pop or Old Vines Grenache from, from uh, Australia. So I, I didn't realize I would get those confused, <laughs> or I didn't realize that I would get Zinfandel confused for Oregon Pinot Noir until I did, <laughs> you know? Or one that was really important that I see a lot is um, Beaujolais, especially like um, a Nouveau, or not Nouveau, but like a Village character wine with Sangiovese. And you're probably looking at me like, who would why would you ever do that right but sometimes with the color and certain producers um like let's say um a pianti let's say uh the color sometimes would match and then that initial hit of tannins from carbonic or from stems or whatever it might be um give you this impression of the tannins being way higher than they really are because that initial hit is like a big pop of tannins you know like medium plus tannins you know but then they die really quickly and then all of a sudden they're medium minus and so it's interesting to um that i wouldn't say putting sangio and beaujolais in your laterals but realizing where things can get tripped up and kind of ironing out those things um ahead of time or finding the and quality level a couple couple questions and thoughts here um one with appellation i think that's where that's really important is when there's a quality distinction so that quality level can can apply to appellation and it can also apply to hierarchy within an appellation so for example like we mentioned the difference between say a coat roti and a crozier montage there's kind of a quality level implied there that may help you kind of with the appellation of which kind of appellation um, but then when you get to the kind of regional hierarchy, you've kind of assumed you're in, you're, you're in a region and they, that has an existing hierarchy. So we're talking about Crianza, Reserva, Grand Reserva, or Cabinet, Spätlese, Auslese. So do you want to talk about, let's say you've gotten to a specific appellation, what are some of the regions where regional hierarchy is important? Because not, in, not, not every region is going, we're going to have to specify a hierarchy but maybe we can highlight some where that's important. Yeah, so starting with France, we'd be looking, um, let's say, first of all, at, let's say Bordeaux. Uh, so for Bordeaux, we would be starting off, well, first of all, mentioning right bank or left bank, and you're already there. And then the Appalachian, are we talking about um, uh, Bordeaux AC? Are we talking about Cru Bourgeois? If it's a, um, if it's a white Bordeaux, are we talking about Pesac Lognon? Are we talking about Bordeaux, um, which I know that you can hem and haw on that, quality level, uh, that being a quality level. But that's the appellation, but then you're diving into a crew. So if you were saying, and you don't have to say this is like fifth growth or fourth growth Margot, or I think this is, you know, you can just say a crew class A, keep it simple. You don't have to start <laughs> calling uh, levels, but maybe for um, Santa Million, that would be important. Um, saying a, a grand crew class A, and then, I mean, whether you want to say A or B, but a classified growth um, would be appropriate. I mean, when we move um, around over to the Rhone, when we find the, as Jeff was mentioning, the Appalachian sort of indicates sort of the quality level too. Are you saying it's a Cote de Rhone? Are you saying it is a, a Cote de Rhone with a village? Or are you saying it is um, a village like a Chateauneuf de Pop or a Gigondas or Vaqueras or something like that? Same goes for the Northern Rhone too. Uh, of course, we'll yes. 
Burgundy, of course, good, another good example for quality level. Knowing that is this a, a Bourgogne Rouge? Is this a Grand Cru wine? Where where on the quality level? So that would be an important one to to note. And you know, I know in our nervousness, you know, we forget. But then if we're calling, you know, a Cote de Bone and we're saying, you know, Grand Cru, we have to remember, you know, which ones we're thinking of here, you know, that we're being a little more um, specific yeah, in, in the flavors, the intensity of the oak um, can get you there on the, the quality level. Same thing for Burgundy, or for, sorry, for Beaujolais as well. So is it a, and that's a huge quality distinction. It's not only quality, but flavor distinction. Are we talking about Beaujolais Village? Are we talking about Beaujolais Cru? And uh, knowing how wine make, knowing winemaking these days and where the trends are going um, with those specific producers is an important one. A, a few others that come to mind, obviously, would be in the Mosul, your, your you know, Cabinet, Spätlese, Auslese, Baron Auslese, make sure to call that. For, for Gruner in Austria, um, like a Vaca wine, is this a, um, you know, a Federspiel or a Schmaragd? That would be an important distinction. Um, Reserva categories in both Italy and um, and Spain, I think, would be mm -hmm. important distinction. So just always, because sometimes people will skip over that. One, you know, they've gotten through most of this, but then they've gotten down to whether it's Bordeaux or Burgundy or or Mosul. But make sure that that if that region has some sort of a quality hierarchy, that that's an important thing to mention. And and Alsace as well. I mean, mentioning AOC versus Grand Cru is um, is a big deal for qualitatively as well. Um, trying to think of some others, but it's you know, mainly um, an, a, an old world thing that I can think of off the top of my head. But uh, I mean, there are new world instances that we are. And so the quality level here, we're not looking for whether it's good, <laughs> good quality. We're looking for these quality hierarchies that Jeff mentioned. Great. Great. So um, the, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that I um, hope that you got a good sense of what it takes to go through the grid at an advanced or master level uh, to take a really hard look at cause and effect and the theory of um, winemaking and viticulture, grape varieties of the world, and how wine is being made today how much that all plays into your deductive tasting, how they all interrelate, that when you're studying for theory, you're also studying for tasting, and when you're studying for tasting, you're also studying for theory. And all of that will play a role in, in helping you in your job, in your world, as a sommelier, and your overall knowledge. So I know that this takes a lot of homework, and it takes a lot of repetition. It takes a lot of, um, like I mentioned, theory study. But um, hopefully putting all those things together will uh, lead to a successful tasting. Well, thanks, Melissa. So um, actually, I wanna, um, I'm going to pass this over. If you want to sh share your screen back to me for one second, um, I just wanted to point out a couple of resources uh, that we have on our site that might help you with some of these things. Um, and so I'll just point out a couple things here on the um, on the Guildsom site. So um, if you go to the blind tasting section here on Essentials, um, our videos, uh, podcasts, and what I mentioned earlier, that expert guide that's linked here. It's also, of course, in the expert guide with the expert guide to tasting. But we also have some blind tasting by grape varieties. And so if you're struggling with an individual grape, um, if you click on any of the grapes, and this is a fairly new area we're developing, but people can post questions or topics here. Um, they can get voted up, for example, good examples of the Viognier for tasting group, or how do you distinguish a Viognier from a Gewurz or a Muscat, and we can have some back and forth discussion. So um, hopefully these can provide some resources to, uh, for, for people if you're studying within the CMS program or, or others. So um, uh, I, check that out and, and hopefully we can be more help online. But um, I want to really thank Melissa so much for taking the time to do this. Also to thank the court for uh, for doing this and bringing this to the audience. I think um, it's going to be really appreciative. So um, really appreciate it. So thank you so much for your time, Melissa. Thank you.